Hey guys, in this playlist, I've already recorded at least 10 videos on duration and convexity, which are the two most common measures of single factor interest rate risk. So I thought in this video, I would just try to wrap it up in one simple explanation that tries to illustrate both duration and convexity and how we apply them with the simplest possible example, which I have here. So I've just imagined a three-year bond it pays a coupon semi-annually, so there are six cash flows. The coupon rate happens to be 4% per annum, and the yield, which can also be changed, in this case is 5%, so that the spawn's theoretical price, its present value, is $97.25. And then here, I've computed the duration in this column and the convexity in this column. But first, I would just emphasize that these reflect, these values should reflect their plain English definitions. And those are, in the case of duration, the definition of duration is simply the weighted average maturity of the bond. In the case of convexity, it's simply the weighted average maturity squared of the bond. So the key there is the weight. What do we mean by the weight? The weights are right here. The weights are just the present value cash flows as a percentage of the bond's price. So we have here six cash flows, six rows. If I consider the final cash flow, here's the future value, par plus the coupon, $2, it's half of the 4%. In present value terms, the present value of this cash flow is $87.95, and that is 90.45% of the bond's price. So these weights here, they simply take the bond's price and carve it up into the contribution of each cash flow's present value. And of course, that final cash flow in present value terms will have most of the weight. So that's what we're weighting the maturities by to get the duration, such that in this column, it's simply the term or maturity, in this case, first cash flow, first coupon in six months or 0.5 years, multiplied by that weight, that weight which in turn is present value of the cash flow as a percent of the bond's price. So what we're getting here is really 0 0.01 years. Sum those together, and we have here the bond's weighted average maturity, which is also the Macaulay duration of the bond. And it's 2.85 years. This bond has a coupon, so we expect something less than three years, but not too much less than three years, which we get. We can translate that Macaulay duration into the modified duration by simply taking the Macaulay duration and dividing by 1 plus the yield divided by 2, 2 because we're compounding twice per year. That's the compound frequency. If we were doing 12 times per year, like in a mortgage, we would use 12. Annual, we'd use 1. If it were continuously compounded, this would be infinite, the denominator here would then reduce to one. And we have that special case where the modified duration would equal Macaulay duration. The convexity is not that much different in this context because the weights are the same. All that we've done is squared the terms or maturities. Remember the English, plain English definition of convexity is the bond's weighted average maturity squares. Because this is semi-annual or discrete compounding as opposed to continuous compounding, I would say, I would call this an almost squares. In the case of continuous compounding, we would just square the maturity. Here you can see I've got 0.5 multiplied by 0.5 plus 0.5. So we add 0.5 in each case because as a this is a convexity is a function of the second derivative, and in solving for this second derivative in the discrete case, we end up with here with something that's slightly greater than the maturity squared, but doesn't need to change our fundamental definition. So <clears throat> as here we're getting years, here we're getting years squared, and the sum of them here happens to be 9.82. So we could say 9.82 years squared is... The convexity or we want to be proper, we could say it's the Macaulay convexity. And if we want to translate that into the modified convexity, more normally known as the simple convexity, well, it's very similar. We just take the 9.82 and divide by 1 plus the yield divided by 2 because we are two compound periods per year. The only difference here is we're basically in squared land. We're squaring it. 
And so our modified convexity, or what we also just call our convexity here, is 9.35 years squared. But hopefully I've explained how this is really just the bonds weighted average maturity squared or weighted average of maturity squares. Key property is zero coupon bond. And for those who are sitting for a financial exam, here's a tip. The zero coupon bond is oftentimes used only because it's the one we can conveniently calculate. So if I change the coupon here to zero, notice a zero coupon bond will have a Macaulay duration equal to its maturity. We have a three-year bond. The weighted average maturity being ha this zero coupon bond having only a single cash flow at year three will have a Macaulay duration of three. My modified duration says three, and that's an accident because I divide by the coupon instead of the yield. I meant this. And for our zero coupon bond, the modified duration should be a little bit less than the maturity, 2.93 years. And then in the case of convexity, we have the discrete case. If it were continuous, the convexity would be three squared or nine squared years, but we have a discrete case. so. All I would say about that is that we want to expect a convexity for the zero coupon bond that's in the neighborhood of the year, the maturity squared or three squared or nine, but we don't want to be predisposed. You can see here, I have an outcome here in discrete where the convexity is actually a little bit greater than that. Okay, I'll put the coupon back 4%. That's the definitions of maturity, uh, duration and convexity both for the Macaulay and the modified case. We use the modified duration and modified convexity, aka just convexity, in as the key risk measures of interest rate sensitivity. And remember, they'll be the same in the continuous case, and it, but in the discrete case, they will be a little bit less than their Macaulay counterparts. But we want to use the modified versions in this application, which is wh basically why we develop these. We use the duration and convexity in lieu of fully repricing a, a portfolio or a unique situation where full repricing of the fixed income portfolio would be tedious or difficult or maybe next to impossible. The duration and convexity as functions of the first and second derivative give us a way to approximate the change in the fixed income portfolio given a shock to the single factor, which is here, the yield, the yield to maturity. So what we're doing is we have a bond and we want we can imagine any shock to the yield. I'm going to assume, assume a dramatic shock of negative 100 basis points or 1%. The duration here is a simple multiplier. 2.78 years multiplied by that yield shock says to us that the approximation according to duration for that yield change is a plus 2.785% increase percentage in the bond's price, which here, if multiplied by that price, corresponds to a predicted $2.71 increase in the bond price corresponding to that yield change. Duration, however, of course, is just the linear approximation it's that function of the first derivative. It's not going to account for the curvature in the price yield curve. So we have the convexity adjustment, which itself is 0.5 or one half of the convexity measure, one half multiplied by convexity multiplied by the yield squared. Again, we're in convexity, we're generally in squared land. So that term here itself, notice because of the square, will always be positive. So it always adds, and it will be small. In this case, it adds 0.047%, which is only multiplied by the bond price is only a nickel. And so we add those together in percentage terms. Duration for convexity anticipates or estimates or approximates a 2.831% percentage percent increase, percentage of the bond price, given a yield shock or yield drop of 100 basis points, which is a $2.75 increase. So just to illustrate that, what we have here is the estimation, because if I plug in 
negative 100 basis points on my yield of 5%, I'm basically approximating here the price change, the increase of $2.75 on the bond's price. So my approximation here tells me that you can see I've got some rounding here, but my duration plus convexity is telling me that when 5% yield goes to 4%, I'm estimating here an increase of about $2.75, getting me to $99.99.9. .99. And then all I've done here is I've done the full or exact repricing. Very easy to do in Excel with a single bond. So we would never, in the single bond case, go to the trouble of duration and convexity. You just imagine we have a complex situation where we don't have access to this formula. But just to show you how close my duration and convexity gets. On the other hand, if the yield shocked by an increase in the rate from 1%, now I'm estimating the yield change from 5% to 6%. I have my duration, my linear approximation telling me actually that same amount just on the other side because it's linear, negative 2.785%, but my convexity remains additive. So in this case, duration from convexity, duration plus convexity is telling me to anticipate or estimate a drop in percentage terms of the price, 2.738, which is a drop of $2.66, such that my duration plus convexity approximation is estimating a bond price of $94.58.3. And, and actually, that's so close to the estimate that I'm going to take out another decimal just to show you that. My estimate shouldn't be exactly correct, but it's very, very close. And that's why we use duration and convexity to approximate what would be the actual result if we could fully replace a complex or esoteric situation. And that's really 80% of what you need to know for duration and convexity. And I hope that's helpful. Thank you.